Welcome back to World War II TV, folks. We're still talking D-Day. We're still talking Airborne. This time we're talking about the long-held view that partly was started by Stephen Ambrose. That all the American air crews deli- uh, flying the C-47s were hopeless, undertrained, cowardly. The, the adjectives go on. To, to look at this um, this statement is Adam Berry. Adam is the right person to do it. He's written books about the Troop Carrier Command and the squadrons and the units, and he's got another one coming out. So I'll bring him in now. Good evening, Adam. How are you? Hi, Paul. I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm very good. So we're going to just fire away, bring up your PowerPoint, and that's you know you, that that's the idea that we we've all heard it a million times. Uh, all the C-47 pilots were hopeless. They they got they they badly performed on D-Day. Examine that for us, please. Okay. I mean, the first the first image I've got here is a, is a captain by the name of Edison Hines, and he's a pri- he's a good example of the myth that troop carrier pilots were. Um, as it's been put by others, sort of dregs of the aviation cadet programs and the, the sort of guys that finished bottom of the class and that they were pushed towards C-47s because nobody else wanted the job, basically. Um, there's just no evidence to suggest that that's the case at all. If you take Edison as a, as a prime example, Edison was a, was an individual that was actually trained as a fighter pilot. So he learned to fly. Uh, he was part of a pursuit squadron. He flew P-39 Aero Cobras, um, finished at the very highest echelons of his class, but actually went on to be a C-47 pilot. He never flew a fighter operationally during during the Second World War. One thing I'd be keen to point out is that that choice was his. He wasn't forced upon him, so he made that conscious decision. Now, Edison Hines actually graduated from the same class as Richard Cole, who many will, will know was a Doolittle Raider. Right. And he also went on to fly... Uh, fly C-47s during World War II. Edison Hines actually finished higher in that class than uh, than Richard Cole did. So it gives you an idea that these, but just just one name of of of, pilot, of a pilot that was 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 pretty good at what he did. Squadron commanders, group commanders were all brought in based on their flying hours on on the, the aircraft. So any aviation fans that are familiar with the C-47 will know that essentially the aircraft is a DC-3 operated um, by a number of airlines in America, all over the world, in fact, um, before World War II. So a lot of the squadron COs, a lot of the group COs, those in the positions of training guys to fly, had 10, 11, in some cases, 14 or 15,000 hours flying with DC-3. They knew the aircraft like the back of their hand. So um, so again, we're talking about guys with, with significant experience. Um the myth that's been per- perpetuated, really, as I say, is that these pilots were, were were given the task of flying what some would regard as transports because they were were not good enough to fly a fighter or to fly uh, a bomber. But if you actually look into how the aviation cadet program chose its pilots, I mean, if we take fighter pilots, for example, if you were any taller than five foot seven, you couldn't be a fighter pilot. You had to be within a very strict height parameters i think it was between 53 and 57 or something like that you couldn't be heavier than 160 pounds which ruled an awful lot of guys out it would have ruled the likes of dick winters out for example just plucking a name off the top of my head of being a fighter pilot if that's what he chose to do um so we also have to take huge considerations over where these pilots are needed and it's not necessarily the case that going through the aviation cadet program these guys were trained to be c-47 pilots they're actually trained to be twin engine aircraft pilots right so they could have gone on to fly b-26 marauders b-25 mitchells um anything that you know fit in those parameters but after sicily and after italy um towards the end of 43 going into 44 obviously there's a, a huge demand for troop carrier aircrew from a May of 43, we know D-Day is going to happen at some point in time. The planning has began. And, of course, Paul, as you'll know, some of the some of the key airborne personnel um, that were involved in D-Day were there from the very beginning of the planning of, of D-Day, as we've come to know it, D-Day. Um, and th- there was a, a, a pretty quick realisation that in terms of numbers, there's insufficient troop carrier units to deploy particularly the two American airborne divisions over Normandy. But at that point in time, obviously, they didn't really know whether or not 
that would transfer over to the deployment of British airborne forces, um, you know, the Canadians. Um, it, it wasn't really known at that time. So there was a huge um, emphasis placed on the building of troop carrier units, troop carrier groups. So, um, so all of those guys that have gone through the aviation cadet training program to fly twin engine aircraft are pushed towards troop carrier groups. And yes, of course, for somebody that has trained to fly a twin engine aircraft and has seen B-25s and B-26s flying around at the airfields uh, over in the States where they've, where they've learned to fly, many would obviously have wanted to go into that direction. But of course, a professional pilot takes pride in the job that they do. Um, so that's that's the first real real myth that these guys were 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 again in inverted commas the sort of dregs of these aviation cadet programs that um, um, that taught taught these pilots to fly during during World War Two. Are we moving on? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, one of the other things I wanted to mention was. Um, was the fact that there's another one of the big myths, of course, is as with the second slide, is that prior to we, we saw it in a, in a comment in in Marty's previous video, was that the pilots ha hadn't been trained enough. In fact, Stephen Ambrose is one of the most vocal uh, writers in the past in terms of, of of mentioning that the pilots simply didn't train, and and one of the one of the things he he, he is at pains to mention is that they didn't train in nighttime flying. Um, so what's presented to you on the slide um, uh, that we see now is a flying schedule between um, the 15th of March, 1944, and the 27th of May, 1944. And it shows all of the ground air combined operate exercises carried out by nine troop carrier command with airborne forces in the UK. Now, the slide is a little bit smaller. I don't know how, how well you can see it, Paul, but You'll notice on the, those, on, those on the big t TVs can see it. Yeah. yeah, those on the big TVs can see it. But if you look at the timings of those exercises, you'll see that a significant proportion of those exercises are carried out in the darkness hours. So it, it immediately dispels this myth that these guys didn't or hadn't practiced flying their aircraft at night. Um, now, there's 33 exercises on this chart alone. But what this chart doesn't show is the exercises that were organized at a wing level and then below that to the groups and even to the individual squadrons that, that flew the airborne forces on D-Day. Um, I'm always I'm always quick to point out that one of these groups, um, the 315th Troop Carrier Group that dropped the 1st Battalion of the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment on D-Day, less than a month before D-Day, they consisted only of two squadrons. They'd never dropped a paratrooper in combat before. A typical troop carrier group consists of four squadrons. So with there only being two, um, at the end of April and the beginning of May, two new squadrons were formed and immediately they went um, headfirst into an in extremely intensive training schedule to prepare them for D-Day. And they recognised really early on that they would have to work work themselves to the bones in order to get to the point where they were capable of dropping an airborne force in combat and a, a guy by the name of major smiley stark who became one of the squadron co's he got all of his men into the base canteen at raf spano in northamptonshire and he emphasized to them that they they, they needed to work really hard and they immediately found that the, recognized the difficulties in formation flying when it came to flying a c-47 on a on a combat operation or a training exercise. But given the fact that this group was half a size a month before D-Day, as you well know, Paul, the 1st Battalion of the 505th were one of the best dropped battalions on D-Day yep. itself. So it goes without saying that, that the inexperience that these guys had doesn't transfer through to what happened to them on D-Day. There are other mitigating factors that have a a huge impact on how these groups perform on D-Day. They actually flew in the month of May on, I, thinking off the top of my head here, 23 days of May, they flew formation flying practice during the day and at night, including multiple operations on a number of those days. So 
according to their group diary, the only days that they didn't fly were days where, quite simply, the weather prevented them from doing so. Mm. So it gives you an idea of how seriously these guys took the job and how much training they actually conducted in the months running up to D-Day to be at the level that was required of them to drop the, the American paratroopers over Normandy on D-Day. So it brings us on to the second point, the actual formations on D-Day. Um, so as we can see here, we see a three-ship element of C-47s flying. These particular C-47s were pho photographed flying over RF Aldermaston, which was home of 434th Troop Carrier Group. Um, but it shows how closely the aircraft are flying in formation. So a three-ship element would be part of a, um, a three-element flight. So a V of V formation, a formation as it was known. There would be two flights to a squadron and then two squadrons to a serial. So you've got a total of 36, typically anyway, 36 C-47s flying in formation together at intervals like the one that we see here. And if we actually flick over to the, the next photograph, we can see from this photograph just how close the aircraft You almost pass the sandwiches over. across from window to window, couldn't you? Almost, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And of course, there's a reason why they're doing this, and it's because they want the guys that are jumping out of their doors to be as close to each other on the ground as they can possibly be. They want that, that formation to be as compact as it can safely be. But here's where we have a problem. Because on D-Day, there was one thing that the pilots were never briefed about, and that was the cloud bank on the west coast of the peninsula. So the pilots are given their briefing. They're actually given their briefings as early as the 3rd of June, because, of course, as we know, D-Day was originally supposed to be 24 hours before when it was actually launched. So they're given their briefings as early as the 3rd of June, and then they have briefings on the 4th. They they go through all of their briefings again and all of their intel and all of the materials that their S2s have put together for them on the 5th. And then, of course, they carry out the operation on the morning of the 6th. And at no point in all of that time are they given any indication that they'll have to fly through a significant cloud bank when they reach the, the, the west coast of the peninsula. Now, the reason why this is key is because, and, and it depends on what group's diary you read, the cloud bank's anywhere between 500 feet from the deck to 3,000 feet up, which means that realistically the aircraft are flying too low to drop paratroopers below it, and they're way too high to drop paratroopers above it. So it gives the troop carrier groups three options. The first one is you fly below it, meaning that when you reach your DZ, you've got to gain altitude, which means throttling the engines and potentially gaining speed. You fly through it, which means you break the formation up. Or you fly above it, which means you've then got to get back down to the correct drop altitude whilst maintaining the speed of the aircraft, which is like letting your car roll down a hill with the handbrake off and yeah. trying to slow it down without touching the brakes. It's impossible. And you can take a look at this, the next slide. Sorry, I'll skip past this next slide to the last slide here, which is... Um, which is a, a map which was drawn by uh, First Lieutenant William Hitztaller, whose aircraft was actually shot down on D-Day. So we see the peninsula, we see his flight route, and we see how his course has been changed by the cloud bank that he meets on the west coast of the peninsula. And as you can see in his own writing, lost formation in cloud bank. Now, C-47s, going back to the, the final photo, we've got this amazing photo here of Snafu at the Merville gun battery in Normandy with... Uh, a series of blue lights on display as the sun goes down. Now, what yeah. these are are formation lights. Now, these formation lights were, were, were kept on by lead by element leaders on D-Day. So the, in, going back to this, this picture, the first aircraft, the lead aircraft of this element would have his formation lights on. Now, those formation lights are only visible when the aircraft that are flying either side of it as part of the element are in the right position but the moment they fly into that cloud bank in order for the safety of the paratroopers on board their aircraft and for the safety of the aircraft itself and the air crew they have to do something which is called fanning out the formation and they do train to do this back in england they break the formation apart the intervals are bigger the altitude separating the aircraft are bigger and essentially what it does is it limits the risk that these aircraft are going to fly into each other in this cloud bank and if you read testimonies by First Lieutenant Julian Rice, for example, who was a pilot in the 316th Troop Carrier Group, 
he says that as soon as they entered this cloud bank, it was so thick that they completely lost sight of the other aircraft in their formation. So their priority at that point is we have got to make sure that we get the paratroopers that are sat in our cabins to the drop zone in one piece, whether it's on the DZ, whether it's a few miles outside the DZ, our job's to get them on the ground. So they have got to break the formation up. And at that point, the lead aircraft in the element, those nice, pretty blue formation lights that are on its wings on the top of the fuselage, they disappear from sight completely. So the cloud bank in in this particular in this particular map is shown as being quite quite a small one, but some pilots describe the cloud bank as being it's taking them as far as to within a mile or two of their drop zone. So if you're flying at three and a half thousand feet to stay above the cloud and remain in formation, you've then got two miles of flying time, which is not a long time when you're flying at 100 odd miles an hour, 110 odd miles an hour to get back down to altitude to drop your men whilst maintaining a safe jump speed. So the pilots do what they can to slow the aircraft down. Now, if you were in a car rolling down a hill and you couldn't touch the brakes, what might you do? Stick the doors open, make air brakes of the doors, whatever you could to slow the car down. The pilots had a very similar way of trying to slow the aircraft down. Drop the landing gear, create drag, lower the flaps, kick the rudder left to right to create drag, to destroy what very little aerodynamic properties a C-47 has in the first place, to slow the aircraft down. And of course, to the paratroopers who are sat in the cabin in the back, what does that feel like? Well, it feels like the pilots taking evasive manoeuvres yep. to avoid flak, to avoid this, that or the other. In so many cases it's for pilots desperately trying to get the aircraft back to an altitude where they can safely drop the guys that are that are, are let's face it precious cargo to them in the back of their cabin so that's as i say that's the dilemma that these pilots faced is do i fly below this cloud and and risk dropping paratroopers so low their parachutes don't open or do i fly in it and risk flying into other aircraft and to avoid doing that, I'm going to have to break away from the formation. Mm. And by the time we come out the other side of it, I could be flying, you know, I could be flying a course 25, 30 degrees in the wrong direction. And then I've got the issue of trying to find out where I am. I've got the issue of trying to get back to the DZ. Bearing in mind, I could be one in four, air, one in four aircraft, sorry, only one in four aircraft had a navigator on board. Yeah. So what do those aircraft do when they realize they're in the wrong place? They've got that struggle of getting back I can't just tap it into the sat nav on the dashboard and say, bring us back to the correct location. And then, of course, as I explained, we've got the guys that, that opted to fly above the cloud bank that then had the dilemma of getting back down to, to you know, to the right jump height before um, releasing their paratroopers. Mm. And you do have you do have this case where a lot of aircraft remained in formation flying above the clouds and managed to get down to a, a, a decent a decent altitude before the drop. But we're still dropping guys at somewhere in the region of a thousand fifteen hundred feet which is not the end of the world but it's not ideal there's a lot of drift factors you've got to take into that and you know we can look at stories like that of L lieutenant colonel louis mendez a third battalion 508 yeah. commander who is lost for three days on d-day but when you actually look at where he drops he jumps out of his aircraft maybe 10 or 15 seconds after the drop zone but because he lands the wrong side of the Douve river it has catastrophic effects to what he can do on D-Day, but he's actually only missed his drop zone by, as I say, 15 or you know, 10 or 15 seconds worth of flying inside his aircraft. So all of these tiny li little factors go into, into creating the misdrops on D-Day and the pilots having to rectify um, a situation that's thrown upon them the moment they hit the west coast of Peninsula. Now, of course, if the troop carrier groups had known there was a cloud bank on the west coast of Peninsula, they could conceivably have altered their flight course on the night of the operation to avoid it um, and hoped that this new flight course took them in a direction that meant that you know they could remain in formation and fly directly to their DZ without these issues ever having risen their heads. So I was just going to mention it anyway, but two people have just mentioned in the catch up there about the, the the idea of the paratroopers being overloaded. I mean, it's something I used to say. Is is that something that happened? You know, this idea that you know, these paratroopers have done lots of training jumps, but they know this is the one. This is the one they're actually facing. You know, occupied 
France and make sure you've got an extra bag of grenades, an extra bandolier, yeah. and maybe one more thing. And, you know, you multiply that by 19 or 20 guys in their stick. They've each got 10 pounds extra in weight. That's another, you know, 200 pounds on the aircraft. The equipment bundles being heavier. Is that, yeah. did that influence the, the inability for the pilots to, to, to keep speed? Absolutely. Um, we're lucky enough, actually, that with, uh, as you all know, Paul, jump manifests for D-Day are, are fairly rare, unless you're looking at the 507th. 507th. So we're lucky enough. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 nightmare fuel for um, for, for historians of the airborne operation, but it's they just don't exist. But in, in the cases that they do, they're often detailed enough that they show the air crew's individual weights as a as a person. And they show the weights of the parachute drop containers that are slung underneath the belly of the aircraft and what they contain. And they give us a rough idea of how, you know, they give us an, an exact idea, sorry, of how many paratroopers are on board. And, and from that, we can we can take a rough idea of how much weight the aircraft have got on board. So George, uh, George Schenkel, for example, who you knew well, who was E Company 508, his manifest is known. His aircraft is still in a museum in, in the States. His aircraft was significantly overweight on D-Day by somewhere in the region of 1,300 pounds. Now, that takes a C-47 well over its gross lift capacity that is what they would regard as being safe. It means the aircraft takes longer to take off, but but more, more significantly for the drop, it means that it has got a higher stall speed. So the pilots are having to take this into sorry, a, a lower stall speed. So the pilots are having to take this into consideration when they are conducting the drop. They can't lower the speed of the aircraft to the speed that they have spent two or three months doing practice drops at, because if they do, the aircraft will stall out and it will fall out of the sky and potentially they'll take 17, 18, 19 highly trained paratroopers down with them. Mm -hmm. So yes, absolutely. And it was, and, and again, looking into it, it seems like it was a significantly larger problem with the 101st Airborne Division than it was with the 82nd, who typically boarded their aircraft with lighter loads. Uh, I think that this is because I'm reading the morning reports that lead up to D-Day, the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment, who, as we know, had jumped into Sicily, but jumped into Italy, but experienced what happens when it all goes pear-shaped, had done training jumps with the 507th and the 508th who of course were both green uh, regiments at this point and i think in those drops they had said to these guys take what you need don't overload yourself because at the end of the day there are ramifications to this so we see the 101st for example carrying taking leg bags on board the aircraft with them which the 82nd did not do and we see pictures of them with 30 caliber machine guns in these leg bags, with bazookas in these leg bags, things that should be going in the drop containers that are underneath the aircraft. And you can see why they did it, because, of course, they knew that once their boots hit the ground, they'd be, they'd be in the midst of the enemy and they'd be fighting for their lives. But in the process, they did significantly overweight an awful lot of the aircraft yeah. on D-Day. We should do a myth show about the leg bags because it's not that the, equip, the, the design was bad. It says that when it didn't work, it's usually because they were overloaded. And again, that's yeah. the speed of the aircraft. But before we just end things off, because we have to, um, it's a shame with this myth is that, that the majority of the troop carrier crews have now left us. So they yeah. would have spent decades reading books people slating their performance and people like yourself and over the last you know two or three decades we've kind of been gradually writing that wrong and some popular historians who used to say yeah and all the pilots hopeless have now corrected their 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 vision of this but it's it's come too late for these guys to get the mm -hmm. recognition yet the paratroopers themselves have been lauded for deservedly but for, for, for eight decades mm, absolutely i 100 percent agree um, there was a very select group of troop carrier pilots who who went who went well out of their way whilst the likes of Stephen Ambrose was still with us as well yeah. to to try and say well hold on a minute this isn't quite how it was um, and but of course it, 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 Ambrose was one of these one of these writers that refused to to take on board ad address thing, yeah. it to to put errata sheets in his books and address these these you know these um, these myths. So they remain in his books and they remain on sale and yeah. and, and people Hasn't still read them. Yeah. And, yeah, so. I, I mean, I was always told, I've never checked into this, but five out of six regimental commanders 
of the PIRs within the 82nd and 101st wrote congratulatory letters to the troop carrier command saying, all yeah. things considered, he did a good job. And the only reason the sixth guy didn't do it is he was dead That's or, or yeah. in hospital or something. So you know, at the time, the perception by the, the higher ups was not that this had all gone completely wrong and the pirates. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's mostly a post-war narrative and it connects with what Marty was done about the the, a better story for a parish to tell about, oh, the bloody crew were throwing us around there. We were miles of drop zone. They were trying to take it. And then I was lost on the ground. That's a much better story than, yeah, the crews did a good job and we landed where we were supposed to. That's, yeah. it's, but yeah, the, we are, but, we're stuck. But these airborne guys, these airborne guys were, were smart enough to know that what, what they were doing was, it was a dangerous job. I mean, it yeah. was, and it was an incredibly tough operation to, to pull off and an airborne operation generally. The Allies didn't really get a proper mass parachute jump right until operation vasty at the end of the war the, uh, the unsung never not talked about enough airborne operation but we will leave things yeah. there adam uh, i've had several requests in the in the sidebar to bring you back for a longer show in the in the 2024 so we'll do that and do something around d-day or do something else and we'll do the the structure of a troop carrier unit whatever well whatever you want to do we'll do that so um but great. thanks for for helping bust that myth there i think job well done uh, you've been you've done a fantastic job. So, folks, uh, say thank you for Adam, and I'll join you all in five minutes with Kevin to talk about General Patton. Cheers, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye.